Hello everyone, this is Bill Klein with North Carolina State University. This presentation will cover strawberry disease management from fall to early spring. Just a quick overview. Uh, what we're going to uh, look at today is a review of previous disease talks in this webinar series. I'd like to speak a bit about fumigation and weather effects in the fall. We'll look at post-plant symptoms of strawberry crown diseases in the fall and some of the other diseases that you may see in fall and winter. The previous talks in this series have just been really uh, spectacular. I really enjoyed viewing them and uh, just want to mention the, uh, the topics and the presenters. Uh, botrytis and anthracnose management, uh, Dr. Guido Schnabel at Clemson University. A really good presentation on, uh, on modes of action of fungicides. Uh, so I won't be covering that today. That was a, an excellent talk and one you can go back and review. Uh, Dr. Phil Brannon with the University of Georgia uh, explained how to sample for botrytis and anthracnose uh, resistance. And uh, so that will help you to manage the uh, fungal populations that you have on your farm and help you to know which fungicides are going to be effective on your farm. Uh, Dr. Stanley Culpepper uh, covered soil-borne disease management. Uh, Phil Brannon, uh, black root rot and soil applied uh, fungicides. And Jayesh Samtani with Virginia Tech, uh, alternate fumigants. So a lot of good topics have already been covered. We're going to pick up where these left off and talk about uh, some things that have not yet been covered in specific um, uh, fall symptoms of diseases that you may see and some of the leaf spots and other, other uh, pathogens that show up uh, between now and early spring. Uh, first, just want to say a bit about fumigants. Uh, we have a, a number of products available. Uh, years ago, uh, we were using methyl bromide, which was a really good fumigant and one that dissipated really quickly. And uh, that material is no longer available. So we have uh, quite a few products now um, that are that are, are labeled for use in plasticulture strawberries, but they are more slow, more uh, slowly dissipating. Uh, they stay in the soil longer, and we've seen problems with these products um, causing damage to uh, strawberries when the plants are are uh, set too soon after fumigation. This is a, a photograph from December of 2018, and uh, in this particular fall, uh, we had a lot of cool, wet weather. The fumigant lingered on. The, the grower remarked uh, in this case that they could smell fumigant when they were, were uh, punching the holes and prepping the site uh, for planting. Uh, so uh, what happened here on, on this particular farm was, was just some fumigant damage to the strawberry plants uh, because the fumigant was still lingering in the soil. I, I want to uh, bring this up uh, as, as an example. This is Picclor 60, just a few things that were uh, visible on the label there. Uh, it's interesting to me, there's a minimum five day wait to, uh, to punch holes after you fumigate it under a, a uh, plastic uh, film, and then a minimum of 48 hours after punching holes to plant. But that doesn't tell the whole story. It takes a lot longer than that for this fumigant to, to dissipate. So if you read further down the label, you see there's a, a minimum of 14 days to plant and the label also states one week uh, wait time for every 10 gallons of product that you use per, uh, per row acre. So if you put out the full rate around 44 gallons per acre, it would take four and a half weeks for the, the fumigant to, uh, to dissipate before you can plant. You need even more time than that in cool, uh, wet conditions. So. Again, just want to reiterate, uh, do not plant if you can still smell fumigant. Do not plant if you feel like you're still within the, the um, time period in which that fumigant is still going to be present in the soil and still uh, able to damage the plants. So that, that's all I wanted to cover. I know fumigants have been covered at length earlier uh, in, a, in a previous talk, but um, this is a problem that I've seen in eastern North Carolina. I just want to make sure everyone knows to give the fumigant plenty of time. Now, switching to individual diseases, I'd like to say a little bit about uh, anthracnose crown rot. This is a, a classic symptom that you see here in this picture. You cut the crown open uh, lengthwise and you see this sort of marbling inside the, the crown. And that's, that's very often diagnostic, not, not always 100%, but, but it's a pretty good sign that that's uh, anthracnose crown rot caused by uh, colitotricum. 
This is a fungal pathogen that we've dealt with for, for many, many years. It's a chronic problem in, uh, in plants from nurseries, and uh, you do see some fall plant death uh, from anthracnose uh, just about every year. Uh, plants, when they arrive from the nursery, you may see the, um, the small circular spots on, on the leaves of plug plants before they're ever, ever even planted. And this is an indication that the, the anthracnose uh, crown rot pathogen is, is present in the plants. It's just a distinctive uh, symptom that you should be looking for on plug plants when you receive them. And again, just a, a, a shot there of the crown, the interior of the crown uh, post-infection. Some more pictures of anthracnose crown rot. These are the symptoms that you'll see in the fall and, and also in the spring. Uh, sudden wilting of, uh, of plants and complete plant death. And, uh, and if you cut those crowns open, you see that uh, discoloration in the crown. It's, it's important to have this diagnosed uh, or, or to diagnose yourself to, to have uh, confidence that this is uh, the pathogen that's causing the problem. Because this, this can look very similar to uh, Phytophthora root rot or if I talk through a crown rot. So it's important to, uh, to diagnose this correctly. Just another couple shots there of, of anthracnose crown rot uh, symptoms uh, as the plants uh, uh, are, are handled in the trays and, and as runners. Now, managing anthracnose crown rot uh, consists of actions you can take before now and those that you can take going forward from, from the fall. So the pre-plant actions that you have already taken are, are things like using disease-free plants, uh, resistant cultivars, uh, and plant dips, either the product uh, called Switch or, or Zivion. These are, are two labeled products that can be used if you, if you think you're at risk of having infected plants. Again, this is already things that, that, have, uh, that have passed. Uh, going forward, now that the plants are in the ground and, and growing, what I would uh, suggest is that you uh, diagnose and remove any wilting plants. I would avoid handling plants when they're wet. At this time of the year, I would apply protectant fungicides, and I'd, I'd save my more systemic products for in the spring when you're in the fruit season. And uh, consider your use of row covers, something to uh, avoid making a moist chamber underneath the row cover. Uh, you really want the, um, the row cover to provide your freeze protection, but if you're also trapping a lot of moisture under there and a lot of heat and humidity, uh, you're going to encourage this and other diseases. So. So just be aware the row covers are a good thing for freeze, but it, it may have to come off um, you know, warm, wet weather uh, where you might be encouraging diseases. Now, the other crown disease we see most often in strawberries in the fall is Phytophthora crown rot. This is a different pathogen. It's a water mold, uh, and the, the way you control it is different from anthracnose crown rot. So when you see wilting plants, um, this is Phytophthora crown rot, but it's very difficult to tell from anthracnose crown rot. Uh, Phytophthora crown rot, in, in my experience, is a little more likely to have a, a sort of a living uh, portion of the crown in the center of that, that wilted plant. It, it, the plants tend to linger on a little bit longer than anthracnose, but you really can't tell just by looking at them in the field. So in a situation like this, what I did was dig some of these plants, send them to the plant disease and insect clinic at NC State, and they were able to, uh, to give me a diagnosis on this. So this turned out to be uh, Phytophthora crown rot. Uh, if you cut crowns open, it does look a little bit different from uh, anthracnose crown rot. There's less marbling and more of a, just a solid brown discoloration in the crown. Another shot of that, 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 that uh, sort of solid chocolate brown discoloration in the, in the crown of the plant. And when you see the plants in, in trays, uh, anthracnose crown rot to me looks a little bit Drier, I guess, is, is a way to put it. And the Phytophthora crown rot is more of a more of a damping off, more of a soft rot of the of the plants. When I'm checking for Phytophthora crown rot uh, in in uh, plug tray plants, uh, you can pull out uh, those young plants, take some of the young roots that are turning brown, and squash them on a microscope slide uh, under a cover slip, and look at them under the microscope, and actually see these O spores inside the infected root. So these round, double wall structures we're seeing here are the spores of Phytophthora crown rot. Again, something if you have access to a to a microscope, you can can do some diagnostic things yourself. Managing Phytophthora again in green are the actions you've already taken: disease-free plants and selecting a a, a good site that doesn't have standing water or poorly drained soils. Uh, going forward from this point, uh, you're going to diagnose and remove wilting plants, uh, monitor and conserve irrigation. Remember, this is a waterborne pathogen. 
can spread plant to plant in saturated soil. And the, uh, the products that you would use are very different from anthracnose crown rot. In, in this case, uh, methanoxam or metal axle, um, the, the water mold uh, products are, are what you would need to apply through a drip system uh, in fall and spring uh, to manage Phytophthora crown rot. I'd like to take a look at a few other diseases and disorders. Um, the picture in the background is a sample that came into our plant disease and insect clinic. A couple of clues there that this is not one of the crown rot diseases. Uh, you see the, the crown is cut open and, uh, and it's clear inside. There's no, no discoloration. And also that marginal leaf burn on the, on the leaves is, is, uh, is very indicative of, of some sort of salt injury or chemical injury. So this turned out to be fertilizer injury uh, and you see that marginal leaf burn and the, the clear, uh, clear plant crown. So proper diagnosis is important because this is not something that's caused by a disease, at least not in this picture. I want to mention another uh, disease that we haven't really talked about yet so far in the series, uh, which is bacterial angular leaf spot. And this is Anthemonas fregarii. It's a, a bacterial pathogen that causes angular spots on the leaves and so what you see here in this image is, uh, is spots on leaves that are not round like, like uh, fungi cause, but that are, are angular and they're delimited by the veins in the leaf. Uh, so a very different look to the, to the leaf spot. And, and again, this is a bacterial disease that can come on uh, plants. The, the other symptom that you see that's really, uh, really most worrisome to me with, with uh, angular leaf spot is brown cap. On, uh, on ripening fruit. So the uh, bacteria can also infect the sepals of the flower, the, the, the part of the flower that forms that nice green cap on the fruit. And, uh, and of course, this fruit is no longer marketable once the, the cap turns brown. It, it, it looks, uh, looks like it's old or defective uh, fruit. So a, a really uh, frustrating disease to have uh, with otherwise healthy fruit that has this, uh, this brown cap symptom. Now for managing bacterial angular leaf spot, uh, actions you've already taken are, are hopefully to get disease-free plants. You want to select a dry, sunny site, so the, they have good drying conditions for the leaves. Uh, I would encourage you to have, uh, have good weed control. Uh, if the middles are weedy or you have weeds coming up in the plant holes, it's going to hold moisture around the plants and, and, uh, and cause this disease to be worse. You want to avoid handling plants when they're wet. You want to monitor and conserve irrigation. So row covers are the preferred method of freeze protection rather than overhead. Because the more water you put on, the more, more problems you're going to have with, with a bacterial angular leaf spot. Uh, copper compounds can be used at the early green fruit stage if, if you see a lot of leaf spot and you're worried about this brown cap symptom. But you really have to be cautious with coppers because too much copper uh, can cause plant injury, and you'll you'll uh, you'll see uh, uh, damage to leaves and to uh, to fruit and and those caps as well. Um, a couple of other uh, leaf diseases that you may see in this time of year through the winter, uh, Phomopsis leaf blight has this large uh, lesion on the the leaf that is usually uh, wedge shaped. So this is a very distinctive look to this pathogen. It's a fungal pathogen that is usually controlled in the process of controlling other diseases. So uh, when you see this, this um, Phomopsis leaf blight, it's not something I generally tell folks to go out and spray for. I think you're already using fungicides for, for other pathogens and you'll control this a, as a byproduct of that. Another really common sample we get in the plant disease and insect clinic at NC State is strawberry leaf blotch. This is Zithia or, or the old name uh, um, more commonly used was pneumonia. Um, but uh, it causes these, these um, small circular spots that, that coalesce and eventually uh, kill uh, a section of the leaf. This is, is again, one of, the, one of these cool season or winter season diseases that we see, probably because fungicides are not getting used much uh, at that time of the year. And it's a really common sample in, in the clinic at, at NC State. But again, it's not something I recommend spraying for with fungicides, I think. Once you start uh, fungicide applications in the spring for botrytis and anthracnose and other pathogens, you will control this as well. I want to mention a new disease that's, that's uh, worrisome, and it's, um, it's a pestilocia type uh, fungus. Uh, it's a pathogen that causes leaf spots and 
crown discoloration and also uh, fruit rots, we have always had a background of these uh, Pestilotia or Pestilotiopsis uh, uh, genus uh, pathogens. Very distinctive looking spore shape, um, and they, they've always been around as a weak pathogen or a secondary invader, not just on strawberries, but on a lot of different plant species. And uh, we've recently uh, seen in, uh, in Florida first, and then also in Georgia in, uh, last year, um, a Pestilotia-like organism that is, is causing uh, more problems. So it's coming up on our radar as, as something we may need to control. Just want to make sure you're aware of it and, and uh, know what it looks like. And, and if you do suspect this pathogen, we sure would like to get samples and get it uh, diagnosed. Uh, the pathogen is, is named Neopestilotiopsis. So it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a mouthful to say, but it's uh, Neo for new, uh, Pestilotiopsis. So uh, it's been reported causing uh, crown disease, leaf diseases, and fruit rot uh, in Florida and Georgia. It's thought to be introduced on planting stock. It's not visibly distinguishable from other Pestilotia fungi. So it's something that we would like to get into the uh, diagnostic labs and have, uh, have uh, tested in the lab so that we know whether it's this particular type. So hopefully you can uh, report this for us and submit samples for diagnosis. Uh, if you see this sort of uh, fruit rot in the spring uh, with this uh, black looking spore masses on the surface, uh, leaf blighting, crown, crown disease. Um, so far, the most effective fungicide has been uh, thyram. So that would be uh, a, a protectant type fungicide that you could roll into your uh, spray program to try and manage this pathogen. So to uh, summarize the fall winter disease management strategies, uh, I think diagnosis is really key because some of these things look alike, but they're different and the way you manage them is, is, is different. So. Uh, a good diagnosis is important. Uh, at that point, then, you can treat as needed based on that correct diagnosis. I'd love to see folks managing row covers with an eye towards avoiding that moist chamber effect that, that traps moisture and heat around the plants and can encourage disease if the, if the covers stay on too long. So be aware that that's part of your disease management uh, practice is to, just to manage the row covers properly. And in the fall of the year, I encourage folks to use uh, protectant fungicides and save the other fungicide modes of action for uh, spring disease control uh, during harvest. Uh, as always, I want to refer you to uh, smallfruits.org and to the uh, Strawberry IPM guide that's on the website there. And would like to really thank all the, uh, all the section editors and Rebecca Mellinson, the, the commodity editor for the the tremendous work that goes into these uh, guides. And it's just a, a really great resource uh, for us all. They're updated every year, so lots of good information there. And I, I encourage you to check that out. And uh, that's about all I wanted to cover today. I, I hope this information has been uh, useful to you and uh, glad to answer any questions you may have uh, about uh, fall and early spring uh, strawberry disease management. Thank you.